WPBF 25 News and the Florida Press Association present The Race for Governor, the Democratic Primary Debate, underwritten by Florida Justice Association, featuring candidates Andrew Gillum, Gwen Graham, Jeff Green, Chris King, and Philip Levine. Now, here's your debate moderator, Todd McDermott. Good evening and thank you for joining us here tonight for the Race for Governor Democratic Primary Debate. This is the final debate before the August 28th primary election. We're broadcasting tonight live from the WPBF 25 studios here in Palm Beach Gardens in Palm Beach County. WPBF 25 and the Florida Press Association would like to welcome our entire statewide audience tonight. I'm Todd McDermott, the evening anchor here at WPBF 25 News and, as you heard the announcer say, your moderator tonight. We'd also like to welcome all five candidates to our WPBF 25 studios tonight. Over the next hour, they'll be answering questions on important topics and issues impacting the people of Florida. And joining me tonight to ask questions of the candidates are panelists. Nancy Ancrum, editorial page editor of the Miami Herald and political reporter George Bennett from the Palm Beach Post. Now to a quick rundown of the debate format tonight. The candidates already know these rules. Each candidate gets 45 seconds to respond to a question. Candidates are eligible for 30 second rebuttals. Follow-up questions and those rebuttals are at my discretion. We also want to make it clear that the two Republican candidates for governor declined our offer to participate in their own debate. Our first question is for each of the candidates with the order determined by a prior drawing. And we're going to begin with Mayor Andrew Gillum. Next year marks a quarter century since the people of Florida actually selected a Democrat as governor. How has the Democratic Party lost touch with the Democratic voters? And why are you the best candidate standing here tonight to change that? Well, I tell you, I, I'm, I'm, I don't buy the narrative that we've necessarily lost touch with Democrats. I just think uh, Democrats need to understand what it is that we believe in. I am uh, from Miami, even though I'm the mayor of Tallahassee, Florida, born to my mother, Frances, who was a school bus driver, and my daddy, Charles, who was a construction worker. I'm one of five, a set, fifth of seven kids and the first of my siblings to graduate from high school and graduate from college. I have to submit that my lived experience in this state is more like the voters who we need to win uh, than anybody else running. Uh, I am the only non-millionaire running for governor. Uh, I've got a mortgage and we've got uh, three kids that we work hard to take care of. Uh, I believe that we deserve a seat at the table too to represent the voices of everyday people. And I think that's how we're going to get regular voters to engage in this process again. Mayor Gillum, thank you very much. Same question to Jeff Green. If you'd like me to repeat the question, sure. I will. Again, it is how has the Democratic Party lost touch with Florida voters, and why are you the best candidate here tonight to change that? Well, we haven't lost touch, Todd, at all. I think that the Democratic Party is alive and well and kicking. The problem is we've been outspent by Republicans over and over again. People say that Florida is a purple state or a swing state. It's neither. It's a blue state that, unfortunately, has been outspent. Look at the last election. Rick Scott spent $120 million, and we only spent $50 million. We lost by 1%. So that's going to be different this year. I have the resource. I'm prepared to put them up into this campaign to win. But I'm best qualified because I think I have the most experience. I've solved big problems my whole life, and I'm prepared to address the very complex problems facing Florida as governor. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. Same question now to you. Chris King. Uh, Todd, I believe uh, that we've got a real problem. Uh, when it comes to winning the contest of ideas in Florida. Uh, this is not a money problem. It's not about having more money to try to get our message out. It's about presenting a vision for the people of Florida that gets them excited. And it's about doing that with political courage. You know, I've argued that the Democrats have been very good at losing statewide elections since 2000. This year, we can change that. But we only do that if we have the courage to take on some of the most powerful interests in this state that have stood in the way of progress. If we're willing to offer solutions to the affordable housing crisis and to access to community college and universities that so many of our families want, that's how we win. Mr. King, thank you. Same question to you, Mr. Levine. Do you want me to repeat the question? I will. It's about losing touch with Democratic voters in the state, Florida voters, and why are you the best candidate here to fix that and become a Democratic governor of the state? Thank you, Todd. I am uh, the son of a single mom. I'm the second person in my family to graduate college. And uh, matter of fact, I'm a proud product of Florida public schools. 
Uh, my journey in life was to take a job on a cruise ship, get off and, and build a company. Started it from nothing and I grew it and was successfully able to sell it. Then I became a two-term mayor. And becoming a two-term mayor that got things done, that passed an ordinance to raise the minimum living wage, that fought climate change and sea level rise, that actually reformed a police department and had the highest LGBTQ scores in the history of the state of Florida. What I think that I bring to voters is somebody that's the best of the private sector mixed with the best of the public sector. What people want are politicians that don't talk about what they're going to do. They want leaders that have actually done things. And I think what I bring is that authenticity of someone who's actually done the things I said I'd do. Mr. Levine, thank you. The same question to you, Ms. Graham. Thank you. Florida, this is not a drill. After 20 years of Republican rule, our schools are being starved. Our lakes and rivers are covered in blue-green algae. A woman's right to choose is on the line. Now, I look a little different than the other candidates on stage. I'm a mom, former PTA president, public school official, and I serve Florida in Congress. This is not a drill. It is time to take our state back. If you are ready to end 20 years of one party rule, I am ready to lead. Ms. Graham, thank you. Let's move on to our next question. Again, this is a question for all the candidates tonight. We'll begin with you, Mr. Green. When school starts in Florida in just 10 days, every school is now required to have an armed law enforcement officer on campus. The legislature provided some $162 million to fund that. It is not enough money. How will you make sure that each school is protected and how will you guarantee money isn't taken from paying for the fencing, the door locks, metal detectors, and other measures needed to harden our schools against, God forbid, another attack? You know, I'm the father of three young boys. I have three boys in school, four, six, and eight years old. And I can tell you what the NRA and Mary and Hammer have done to our state is shameful. You know, just last week I was in a fight with her because she called a provocative mailing that I did repulsive. And I, I think that what they've done to our communities is repulsive, making our schools unsafe. But I'll answer your question. We need to have our schools, they, we're going to have to change the way we have our schools, single entry schools. We're going to have to have armed guards. Well, we can't have teachers with guns like Rick Scott has proposed. We need to have, provide real security for our schools. Our kids need to worry about grades, not guns. And I think that uh, as governor, we will make that happen. There's plenty of money for this. It's just a question of priorities. And we will make sure there's enough money for the, to, to defend our, kids, our schools. Right, Mr. Green, thank you. Same question. Now to Chris King, again, the question is how to make sure each school is protected and guarantee that money uh, isn't siphoned off from the hardening methods that we have, the, the locks, the, the bulletproof glass, et cetera, fencing needed to harden our schools against a possible attacker. I have young children in public school and in just a couple of weeks, they'll be starting another year. And parents all across the state come up to me and say they are terrified uh, about sending their children to school uh, in this environment. And you know, I believe that the governor can do so much more to creating the resources to protect our children. That's why I'm so proud that our campaign has offered one of the most ambitious policies in this race for governor. What many people have called a bullet tax to protect our children. Because that we know for the last two decades, the NRA has flooded our communities with ammunition and firearms. It's time they take some responsibility in paying for the cost of protecting our families. Mr. King, thank you. Same question to you, Mr. Levine. Thank you. First of all, what we need to do is formalize this entire process. After 9-11, our, our government put together the TSA, and of course that secured our airports. My vision, my idea is to create an ESA, an Education Security Administration, that we fund fully to secure our schools. People say, what will that cost? Can we afford it? And my question and my answer to that is very simple. We can't afford not to do it. We do not want to arm our teachers with weapons. We want to arm them with bigger paychecks. The same way at the airport. We didn't ask our baggage handlers to start carrying guns to secure the airport. We're not going to ask our teachers to do that either. We need to create a model of the ESA, the Education Security Administration. We will fund it by stop giving away corporate tax breaks. We don't need any corporate loopholes. We're gonna make sure that everyone pays their fair share. We'll do it without no new taxes. 
All right, and the question again now to you, Ms. Graham. Again, it's guaranteeing that money isn't taken from paying for those, those hardening methods for our schools at the same time, trying to make sure we fund the armed officers at each and every of Florida's 4,500 schools. Well, thank you for that question, Todd. I'm a mom. And I have looked into the eyes of parents as they have fear about dropping their children off at school. This is unacceptable. And I also know that those who are so passionate about this issue across the state of Florida, and particularly the students, the students who have stepped forward and been a voice that we are all listening to, what they want is action. They want to have not just words of people running for office, but what are you going to do to make our schools safer? So I have found a, a public safety statute, a Florida statute, that allows the governor, whoever she is, to issue an executive order banning the sale of military-style assault weapons. I'm going to sign that order. It's going to be one of the first things I do as governor. And I've been told that I'll be sued by the NRA. And you know what I say? Bring it on. All right, before we move on here, uh, I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Green, I, or Mr. Gilman, I'll let you answer that question as well. But Ms. Graham, uh, once you sign the executive order, if indeed you are able to do so, once the NRA sues, will a ban on assault-style weapons end up just tied up in court and not be available to the state during that time? I anticipate being sued, but it's going to be an actionable step that the governor should take to protect our schools. And we do not need these weapons of war out on our streets. And it's time that we take action so that we don't have another school shooting like we saw at Stoneman Douglas. I'm committed to the students across the state and across this country to take action for their safety. And if Florida, who has been following, who's been under the control of the gun lobby for too long, takes the lead on this, it's the lead that we should take. Ms. Graham, thank you. I want to now address the original question again to, to Mayor Gillum, and that is, how do you make sure our, we have the money, that money is protected to protect our schools with methods to keep an attacker out? Mr. Mayor? Well, I'll tell you, the uh, governor and the legislature failed uh, in their attempt to address this. They uh, passed a law and then failed to fund it. At the same time, they have moved more and more of our public dollars out of public schools and into for-profit charter schools. We need to end that. Uh, you want to talk about being sued by the NRA? I've actually been sued by the NRA. They had me in court for two years, all because we refused to repeal an ordinance in my city, which simply said, you cannot shoot guns in city parks. You can't shoot guns in parks where our kids play and our families picnic. And in, and in this state, that was too radical a notion. We need to untangle uh, the power hold that the NRA has on this state. And I'll tell you, uh, uh, I beat them once at the circuit court. I beat them tw uh, second time at the appellate court. And I said, I will see them in the Supreme Court if they want to take it there. We've got to fight back and we can't win if we don't fight. Mayor Gillum, thank you. And now I want to direct uh, you over to our panel, George Bennett from the Palm Beach Post. This is a question to all. We'll start though with Mr. King. George, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Florida right now spends about $7,400 per student in its uh, public education budget. What should that figure be? And um, keep in mind that every $400 in per student spending adds a little more than a billion dollars to the budget. So where would, where would that money come from specifically? Well, well George, uh, you know, I have put forward an ambitious policy around criminal justice reform because what I have argued is we're spending hundreds and hundreds of millions, billions of dollars on locking people up, becoming one of the nation's leaders in mass incarceration as opposed uh, to putting that money into public education and free community college and trade school. In order to raise our per pupil spending, I think last year we added a whopping 47 cents to public education in this state. In order to raise that, I am talking about saving hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from our mass incarceration system. And I'm also talking about a big, bold idea to legalize and tax marijuana, George, that would save another $600 million put into public education. Mr. King, thank you. We're going to take that question again now to Mr. Levine. Great. Thank you. That's a great question. First of all, we're going to expand Medicaid. That's $500 million a year that we're going to bring to Florida. Second of all, we're going to make sure that we stop allowing corporations to pay a 5.5% tax to divert their income out of our state to states like Delaware, where there's a zero corporate income tax. We will put together a combined earnings reporting system. We're going to stop with these corporate tax breaks because Florida is a low tax state, and it should stay a low tax state. 
We're going to stop giving away these corporate incentives because you cannot bribe your way into becoming a 21st century economy. We're going to take the money back from the lottery, put it in the schools where they belong. We're going to make sure we stop investing in someone else's business, which are called charter schools. Put that money back into our public schools. Yes, we're going to make sure that we have sports betting because we're not going to let those hundreds of millions of dollars leave our state. We're going to bring them here. And as you know, I believe that we need to legalize, regulate marijuana. And that is a half a billion to $600 million a year. And I could keep going. Mr. Levine, thank you. George Bennett, you have a follow-up. In charter schools, and a few of you have in the past on the campaign trail, right now there's about 280,000 Florida students who are in charter schools. If you're governor, what happens to those students? Questions to me, George. Sure. Okay. Well, I believe this. I believe, first of all, there are certain charter schools that are very, very specific for folks with special needs, folks that specifically need charter schools. Those schools we do need to keep until we have the capacity and the ability to handle properly those special needs. But otherwise, we're going to invest in our public schools, and slowly but surely, we're going to make sure that our public schools are the best in the country. Because right now, I think we're ranked about 46, and our teachers make $10,000 less than the national average, and that's no way to become a 21st century Mr. Economy. Levine, thank you. I want to let Ms. Graham answer the original question again, and that is, what should the per-pupil spending figure be, keeping in mind that every $400, 000, $400 per pupil in spending adds a little more than a billion dollars to our budget? Thank you, Todd. I am so proud to be the public education candidate up here on stage. I've been endorsed by the Florida Education Association. It's because teachers know all across the state of Florida that my commitment is to restore our promise to public education from one end of this state to the other. Resources are where we've got to start. So we've got to make sure that the lottery dollars are being spent as they were intended to be spent as an enhancement to public education. But we've got to look at our budget as a whole. We have an $89 billion budget. And I know within that budget there are plenty of ways that we can show that the priority of the state of Florida, again, is going to be our public education system, supporting our schools, paying our teachers what they deserve. And the way that we show that priority is making it a priority in our budget. Ms. Graham, thank you. Same question to Mayor Gillum. Well, I have to tell you, uh, public education means everything to me. Uh, having matriculated from uh, kindergarten all the way up through college to the public system, I would not be here today as the mayor of Florida's capital city and certainly not as a candidate for governor, but for uh, what my teachers poured into me. And we ought to begin by paying teachers what they are worth. Uh, starting salaries for teachers in the state of Florida is 45th out of 50 states. We spend about $7,500 a year for a kid to be educated and about $45,000 a year for a kid to be incarcerated. Uh, I have proposed a $1 billion investment in public education that begins with paying our teachers, but also supporting uh, the pay of our support staff. Uh, because if we don't import um, real talent uh, into educating our kids, uh, we can't hope for a brighter and a better economic future for our state. It has to begin with the public education system. Mr. Mayor, thank you. I want to again pose the original question to Mr. Green. Now again, that question from George Bennett is, what should the per-people spending figure be? And at the same time, where should the additional money come from? Mr. Green. Again, it should be a lot more than $7,400 a, a student. You know, the Republican governors over 20 years declared war on public education. You know what? They've won the war. We're now 40th in the country in public education. Do you know that 12th graders in Florida, only 19% of 12th graders can do 12th grade math and only 36% can do 12th grade reading. We've got a lot of work to do in Florida, but I can tell you that, that it, it's the way the money will come from, it's very easy. It's an $89 billion budget. I have two places to come from. Number one, we have to stop the billion dollars we're giving to spend on charter and private school vouchers. That's the billion right there. In the governor's budget this year, is $1.4 billion discretionary. That will get another, that'll get us to $2.4 billion. I'm running out of time. That'll get us another 800, eight, that'll get us another 800 bucks a child right there. And we'll do a lot more. All right, I'm gonna move on now and uh, bring in our other panelists, Nancy Ancrum for the Miami Herald, who has a question to all the candidates. Uh, starting with Philip Levine. Nancy? Yes. Rick Scott called himself the jobs governor, and Florida has seen significant job growth and low unemployment. However, I live in Miami, where according to Bloomberg News, jobs are either high paying or low wage. How will you narrow the income inequality gap and improve the quality of life for low wage workers in a high cost region? 
Thank you, Nancy. I've traveled around the state, and this is an issue for all Floridians. At $8.25 an hour is our minimum wage. No one can live on that. I meet people that take three jobs in order to pay their rent and to be able to have food to eat. Yes, Governor Scott did create a lot of jobs, but he created low-paying jobs. My vision is to create a 21st century economy in Florida. I come from a state called Massachusetts. And you know why Massachusetts and Boston has all the great high-paying jobs? It's not because they bribe their way into becoming a 21st century economy. It's because they pay their teachers a nationally competitive rate and salary, and they have the greatest education in the country. So for in order for us to create better jobs, we need to have, first of all, better education. We need to make sure we have affordable housing. We stop raiding that Sadowski fund. We need to create a 21st century economy. Mr. Levine, thank you. Same question to you, Ms. Graham. Again, it has to do with narrowing the income inequality gap and improving the lives for low-wage workers in this high-cost economy. Thank you for the question, Nancy. When I hear Rick Scott say jobs, 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 I hear, yes, you're going to have to work three jobs in Florida just to get by. And just a couple days ago, I spent time with workers at the Orlando airport, and I heard such challenging stories from them. They're making less than the minimum wage because they're supposed to get, it, they're supposed to get tips, but they're not tipped nearly enough for them to be able to afford their rent, be able to put food on their table, be able to buy their medication. So we in Florida have to do better. We've got to raise the minimum wage. I'm going to fight for 15. We have to provide paid sick leave so that no parent has to decide whether to uh, take care of their child or lose their job. We've got to be a compassionate state again where we care about each other. And when I'm governor, it's going to be the people of Florida that I wake up every day working for you. Ms. Graham, thank you. Same question to Mayor Gillum. I have fully supported a $15 minimum wage in this state. Uh, but I also have to say I don't know a person who wants to earn minimum. Everybody I know who wants to work a job and a job with dignity where they can get a wage and take care of themselves and their families. I remember uh, growing up watching my mother and father trade between which bills they could pay before something got cut off. Working full-time jobs. Uh, that is no way to live, and we've got to improve this economy by truthfully recognizing that Florida can't just be a cheap date state. Uh, we've got to pay people what they're worth, and it's one of the reasons why I have come out with an initiative to ensure that we train our young people on apprenticeships, skilled labor, so that when they graduate, if they're not on their way to college, that they can get a skill that they can monetize, go to work, and get a good job and earn a good wage to take care of themselves and their families. That's how we pull this state up. Not for some, but for everybody. Mr. Gillum, thank you very much. Now to you, Mr. Green, same question. You know, the notion that Rick Scott created a million jobs or 700,000 jobs is ridiculous. He didn't create any jobs. We had, when Barack Obama became president, let's face it, the Senate said, that Mitch McConnell said, we're going to do everything we can to not allow any fiscal programs in Washington. The only game was the Fed. When you print that much money, you get lots of cheap, low-paying jobs. That's, what's, that's why they've come to Florida, not because of Rick Scott. But if you want better jobs, it's very simple. Better education. You know, when you're 40 in the country, think about if you're a small business owner, you're thinking of opening a business or moving your business to the state of Florida. What's the first thing you do? You Google Florida schools. It says, for, you see 40th in the country, guess what? You move on to another thing. When we have great education, when I'm governor, I will fight to make sure that we will have top five schools in the country, and I promise you the good paying jobs will be coming to Florida. Mr. Green, thank you again. The question, Mr. King, I'll repeat it quickly, narrowing the income inequality gap and improving the lives of low wage workers in this state. You know, Nancy, I, I think we share a lot of opinions on what we need to do. But what I would argue is we have not had a governor with the political courage to stand up to some of those forces that keep creating those low wage jobs. This is one of my differences with Congresswoman Graham. I was stunned to read over the last two weeks that her company, the Graham Companies, was building the American Dream Wall in your community, Nancy, in Miami. A mega mall, the largest mall in the country that will be a mecca for low wage jobs built on the edge of the Everglades. You can't make this stuff up. So we can say one thing, but when leaders do another, it undermines our ability to transform the future of Florida. That's why I'm running, because we need political courage in Florida. Ms. Graham, you have the option for a rebuttal at this time if you want to respond Absolutely. to that. Absolutely. Uh, I am so proud of my family's service. I'm so proud of my family's service and public service here in the state of Florida. And I have taken every step to make sure that, that 
that any conflict of interest, any question of a conflict of interest is, is one that cannot go anywhere. I have removed myself from my family company. I have taken the steps to put everything that I have in a trust. And I will make sure that when uh, wages under my administration, they will be $15 an hour wages and jobs where people can live and have a good life here in Florida. Ms. Graham, thank you. We're going to direct this next question. It will go to all. I'm going to have to limit your answers here. I apologize to 30 seconds. We have so much to get to before the first break. This goes first to you, Mr. Green, because in your ads you say you will stand up to President Trump as the centerpiece of your campaign. How exactly will you stand up to the president? How will that benefit the people of Florida? And how, you, how will you do so while you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in dues to President Trump's Mar-a-Lago club? Well, I don't pay hundreds of thousands to any club. But look, I am the only one who stood up against President Trump. The day before the election, I went on television and I was on CNBC and I said exactly what I felt. I will be scared to death to have Donald Trump as my president. And let me tell you something, it couldn't be worse. I've stood up to him since he's been president. And you know what? We all have to stand up. Whoever is governor better stand up to Donald Trump because Donald Trump is organizing these squads that are tearing children out of the mother's arms in the, in, in, in the, at the borders. Mr. Green, we I'm just going to say that you've gone 30 seconds because we don't have a <laughs> direct time queue. I apologize for that. Mr. King, same question. Standing up to the president, how does that benefit the people of Florida? because we need a governor that stands up with courage and integrity and vision. That's what Donald Trump demands uh, based on the way he leads. And you know, Jeff Green calls himself Donald Trump's worst nightmare. But after Donald Trump was elected 20 months ago, he called him a great guy who he was behind 100%. Now it's okay to support the president, but we have to stand up to a guy who we obviously all have a lot of problems with. Mr. King, thank you. I want to get that same question now to Mr. Levine. Jeff, I got to take issue with that. Uh, during uh, Hillary's election, I spent a year and a half of my life fighting Donald Trump and trying to make the first female president of the United States of America. After that election, which Chris King said, my God, you went on and said he's a great guy. A great guy after that election where he literally mocked disabled people. He insulted every woman in America. Matter of fact, he did worse than that. He told John McCain that he wasn't a war hero. He told him he was a coward. He went worse than that. He said he accepted David Duke's endorsement. I got to tell you something. Seriously, that sounds more like you're like Donald Trump. And I got to tell you, one Donald Trump is enough, there, Jeff. Mr. It's Mr. enough. Mr. Green, respond at this time. Mr. Green, you have 30 seconds to respond. Well, Philip, I, that's the, first of all, I'm the only one who has stood up to Donald Trump. And, you know, th this nonsense about you're supporting Hillary Clinton, I'm the only one, I'm the one on, the, on national intelligence against Hillary. When did you stand up to Donald Trump? When I was running for United States Senate in 2010, you gave money to Marco Rubio. Mm. You're supporting the, the, the Republican senator of Florida, and you're complaining that I stood up to Donald Trump? Let me tell you something. I did exactly what President Obama did, what Hillary Clinton did the same day, and I said, you know, we have to stand behind our new leader, and, I, and that's exactly what I did. And I think that we should, I hope when I become Green, governor, you stand behind me. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I want to go to Ms. Graham again to answer the question about standing up to the president. Well, as a mom, I am appalled with what this president represents. We can never normalize it. We can never make it OK, because this is what is speaking to the future generations of Americans. So I have called Donald Trump an embarrassment. And I recognize that we've got to have a president in the White House. We've had presidents, Republican Party, Democratic Party, that we could all, maybe we didn't agree with them on everything. But we knew that they had the country's best interests at heart. I don't feel that way about Donald Trump. When you're ripping babies out of the arms of mothers, you have run up against moms all across this country, Graham, all across thank the you. state. I'm have we to, will I'm not take it. I'm going to have to have you stop there so we have time for Mayor Gilm to respond again. How and what way will you stand up to the president? How does that benefit the people of Florida, Mr. Mayor? Well, I would tell you, I am the only candidate on this stage who has actually called for the impeachment of Donald Trump. Um, and the truth is, I call for that impeachment right as it was very clear that he obstructed justice and the firing of Jim Comey. I'm no fan of Jim Comey necessarily, but the fact is, is that there is the rule of law and this president broke it. And so if you want to talk about standing up to the president, you can follow my lead. Uh, we've led on this issue. Donald Trump is a danger to himself and to the rest of the country. And as far as I'm concerned, to the rest of the world, he's undeserving of the title of president of the United States. Mayor Gillum, thank you. And that is all the time for this part of this debate. Everybody gets to take one breath and one sip of water. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back with a lot more questions for the candidates you're watching. The race for governor, Democratic primary debate.